So we, we just finished our parameterized arc length with our parameterization. Uh, we'd use that little tau so that we could uh, kind of reserve the t variable over here. So now we're gonna find a smooth curve. So we saw curve was a function from some interval. I'll just do capital I into Rn. And usually I is gonna be some open interval A to B or a closed interval A to B generally. Uh, for our purposes, it won't matter so much. We're gonna integrate across it so it doesn't actually matter if you use the endpoints or not. You get the same um, the same length and so smooth. So we know what a curve is, what a smooth. So that was a curve. It's a function from an interval. A lot of times it's negative infinity to positive infinity into n dimensional space, usually three. Now the word smooth smooth if the magnitude is not zero for all t in the interval, and which is another way of saying r of t never stops, or is never stationary. And of course implicit is that in this is r prime of t exists. for all t. So both the derivative exists and the magnitude of the derivative is never zero. And remember the magnitude is zero exactly when uh, the velocity vector or the r prime would be the zero vector. So what this means, so when r of t is a smooth curve, this function we just defined, L of t is an increasing, a strictly increasing function. Strictly increasing function, okay. So what happens if you have a strictly increasing function? I'm going to graph out a strictly increasing function. If we start at time zero, we move zero. And now I'm just gonna put some increasing function. Uh, the point is you go from A to B, A may not necessarily be zero. And if it's not, just take out the Y axis right there. So what happens if you have an increasing, a strictly increasing function is one to one. And what can you do with any one-to-one -one function? You can invert it. So if we can invert it, uh, of course we're going to, and we're, we're gonna use it for something special, which is to change the speed to get unit speed. So this reparameterization, and let's see, we need this function s, which I need to define. So this, in the book, they call this L inverse of t, they call it s of t. S inverse of T. I'm not sure why they changed the name of it. 
Oh, I think I know why, because they called our original L of T, they just called it S. That's probably why. So let's think about this function L, what it actually does, where it goes from and to. So L took a time. So it took a time, some t, and uh, of course this is usually the interval i, and it sent it to uh, a distance. Uh, let's call it a uh, displacement. Displacement from initial uh, initial or starting point. Now I put displacement in quotes. Uh, you can think of a curve that we'll just pretend is in two dimensions. And maybe this curve goes like this. Uh, here we have uh, A, oh, R of A, not A of R, and R of B. So as we move along this path, uh, any point on the path, there's going to be r of some t value right here. So I say displacement in quotes because you don't me measure that is not the displacement at position r of t. The displacement is the distance you traverse along the curve. So it would be the odometer reading on your car, not the uh, difference between GPS coordinates of two points. So it's not really displacement, it's the uh, amount of distance traveled. So I'm gonna put displacement in quotes, it's the displacement along, me as measured along the curve that you're traveling. So we're not taking this as the displacement. So what is L inverse? Obviously we can turn the arrow around. So L inverse takes a position or a distance along the curve and turns it into the time that would occur right there. So normally we have r eating t, or time values. What we're going to do instead, we're going to reparameterize Sorry if you hear my dog whining. He's watched two videos already this morning. And he's not a big fan of Calculus 3. He's more of a Calc 2 kind of guy. So we're going to reparameterize r of t. So we're going to feed r l inverse of, I don't want to use the t variable again, but I'm going to because your book does. So what's really happening here, instead of r just eating a regular t value, what it's going to do, it's going to eat a displacement or a distance along the curve and then turn that into a uh, time. So this L inverse takes a displacement or a distance along the curve and turns that into the time uh, that it would take to get there. And then when we are that value, we will get the position uh, along the curve uh, given a distance. Actually, at this point, at distance, this distance will just be t. So it's a little tricky to think about. Let's think about r of l inverse of 0. Now, this 0 is a distance. Now, this one's easy to see. That's why I picked it, because our initial distance before uh, at distance 0, meaning we haven't moved anywhere. And this is a smooth curve, so this curve, uh, you're never stopping on this curve. So L inverse of zero will be whatever your initial time was. And then Ring that, when you take that and send it to R, it'll give you the initial position. So that is your initial distance. Uh, this whole value is initial time. And the entire thing taken together is your initial position.
And of course, L inverse of zero is generally going to be A. That's your initial time value. Now, I don't know the max distance or the final distance. So let me just use, I don't want to use D as derivative. Ooh. Let's use F. No, then you're going to think of function. Final distance. Finish. Oh, we'll just use F. And use capital F. This will be B. This is your uh, here, F is your final distance. So if you L inverse your final distance, you will get the time that you would arrive at that, um, at that distance. And of course, R, R of B is your final position. And R of A uh, is your initial position. So we're going to do an example that hopefully will help this make sense. I'm trying to figure out what my dog wants at the moment. Probably attention. Sorry about that. All right. So this reparameterization is a curve, except it will be traversed at uh, unit speed. So if you're measuring miles per hour, this would be done at one mile per hour. If you're in meters per second, one meter per one second, et cetera, et cetera. So the unit, of course, depends on the units you're using. Um, and you're using different distance or time measurements depending on, or units depending on what you know, problem you're doing. So we need to do an example, because this seems kind of confusing. So we're gonna find the arc length Parameterization of R of T equals cos T sine T T. And of course, to do this, we're going to need the derivative. R prime of t is derivative of cosine is negative sine t. It's cos t1. And when we do our, let's see. Let's make sure we use the correct L of t function. Here we are. So we, we computed the uh, R prime. So I'll write down uh, R prime of tau magnitude. So I'm going to take T and replace it with tau. And remember, you can write tau as a, basically it's a pi with uh, one leg. Oh, it's like a pirate pi. Whoa. So that's square root. And that square root one plus one is square root two. Okay. So we talked about this function already. It's basically a corkscrew. Corkscrew, spiral, however you want to think of it. If you're into wine, corkscrew is good. If you're into slinkies or springs, that works too. So this is, our primes are going to integrate from 
Ooh, we need to say what T values are gonna go between. I'll just make some up. We'll go. Actually, I don't need any T values, never mind. I'm gonna go T naught to T of this right here is our, well, let's just line it up correctly in the original. Tau D tau integral t naught to t square root two d tau and of course your tau equals tau equals and from here we so I also need the property L of T naught better equal zero because of if we want to know the parameter at uh, the distance traveled at initial time better equal zero. So our distance at the initial time needs to equal zero. So if this is our uh, L of T, and I know L of T naught is zero, which is square root two, T minus T zero, uh, divide by square root two. So we get T minus T zero equals zero. So t equals t0. Whoa. Whoa. That should be t0. Well, that doesn't include very much. What am I doing? It looks like it doesn't matter what T0 is. I'm tempted to just say it's zero, but I want a good reason. Well, let's just leave it uh, square root two t minus t zero and see if everything else works out. So I definitely believe it down to there. So that's L of t, t zero. Now remember, t zero is a number. Maybe it will be more comfortable if we go t minus c for constant. That might be nicer. So c is constant. All right, that's L of T. So C is just some other constant. Just multiply it by negative square root two. And might as well make it look like it's positive. All right, so first of all, is this function one to one? So this might be a little bit tricky function to look at. It's not, I promise you, it's a line. What is the slope? Square root two. So the graph is a little bigger than one if I graphed it out. Uh, I don't know exactly where the y-intercept is. So we'll just say it looks, uh, we can pretend that it's positive, and square root two is a little bit steeper than one, so the graph's gonna look something like that. So we can invert this really easily. And how do we do that? Uh, let's do a really fast review of inverting. So we started out uh, y equals f of x. So if I write this in the form, l equals uh, we'll go 
f of t wait why am I I want to use x and y's what am I doing and then he, I'll flip it back so we swap x and y so I'm going to find f inverse we're going to swap x with y solve for x yes no y all right so x equals square root 2y plus c solve for y so x minus c equals square root 2y divided by square root 2 All right, so that's the uh, inverse function right there. And I'm just gonna put the letters back. So we had L's and T's. So we started with uh, So these are just letters. So we're gonna swap L with T, that's step one. And two is solve, so there's step one right there. T equals square root two L plus C. And then solve for the one that's not solved right now for L, that's step two. So we have T minus C equals square root two L and divide, so one over square root two t minus c over square root 2 equals l and what we have is actually l inverse and if you're a graph person you want to see visually what's happening here's the uh, y equals t function no, whoa, 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 L equals T. And when we flip our graph over, reflect it, it's going to look like that right there. So the slope goes from square root two to the reciprocal one over square root two. So it went from something a little bigger than one to something a little bit less than one. And of course that'll change the y-intercept for sure. The, I shouldn't say y-intercept, the L-intercept. So at that point, whatever coordinates are, you flip them around and you get that point right there. All right, so this is L inverse of T. And now we're going to reparameterize. So I'm using the somewhere R of L inverse of T. So I always like to go inside out on these so this is r of 1 over square root 2 t minus c over 2 and what does r do to this it is wow it's a lot of work cos of that sine of that and then that all right so it goes cos of 1 over square root 2 t minus c over 2 sine of 1 over square root 2 t minus c over you know c over square root 2 let's just let's give that a better name I'm not going to keep writing that everywhere that's constant so let's get more reasonable I'm just gonna go plus C. Comma, one over square root two T plus C. All right, so that looks pretty ugly. A little better with uh, that re, uh, re-picking of our constant. All right, so that is R of that stuff. And now we're gonna go uh, DDT of R of that stuff.
So it's a t derivative here. So we do have a chain rule happening. So this is negative sine one over square root two t plus c. The derivative of one over square root two t plus c is just one over square root two, comma. So that's our derivative of cosine is negative sine of that stuff times the chain rule, which is really just coefficient of t. Derivative of sine is cosine of all that stuff. T plus C, comma. Last is very easy, one over square root two. Okay, so we're doing this because I wanna show you that this works out. Uh, instead of just telling you, ah, oh, it works because I said it works. So this is our velocity. which is V of L inverse of T. So how do we know it's a unit speed? Well, obviously we take the magnitude and see what the speed is. So speed is magnitude of this velocity of L inverse of T. All right, big square root. So I need to square that, whoa. Chain rule. All right. My spuddy sense would have kicked in because we wouldn't have gotten one. Oh, better erase a little more. But I caught my non application of the chain rule right there. Comma, one over square two. There we go. All right, so we're going to square this guy. Square that guy, square the last one, add them all together. So we get sine squared, and it's gonna be positive. One over squared, two squared is one half. Co squared. One over squared, two squared is one half, plus one over squared, two squared is one half. All right, so that's squared term plus squared term plus squared term. All right, factor out one half. So we got one half times sine squared stuff plus cos squared stuff plus one half. So why don't I care what's inside? Because sine squared of that plus cos squared of that is one. So all this stuff right here, sine squared plus cos squared is a one. One half times one plus one half equals square one, which is one. Now notice our t's completely canceled out. It didn't matter what time value, or I should say what displacement, how far along the curve we were, no matter where we were on the curve, from displacement zero to the maximum displacement at the end, our speed was always one. All right, so there is speed, and we just checked it. So we successfully, somewhere. Oh, did I find, here was the arc. <laughs> we did way more than I asked in the example. This, let's see, whoa. Where do I have to find arc length parameterization? There, L of T is arc length parameterization. So if I wanted arc length parameterization, I could have stopped right there. That is uh, how far we've gone after a certain, whoa. Cancel that. There we go, wow. All right, talking to yourself, not the easiest thing. So that's arc length parameterization. What I did all below it was unit somewhere. I, Smooth curves. Did I give this a name? So I just reparameterized the curve traversed at unit speed. So that's what we found at the very, somewhere, the very end.
curve traversed at unit speed. Okay. Took a while to get to. Uh, you don't need, I just ex re explained inverses and uh, how to find them, but you probably already knew that stuff. Uh, it could be more of a pain if you have a quadratic, you'll have to do some completing the square and then be careful about uh, making sure your function is one to one by noting your domain is going to become your range. I better write that down. No, I did that somewhere. Where did I write bubbles? Here we go. So your displacement, this is the range of L, which is the domain of L inverse. So the range of L is the domain of L inverse. And likewise over here, I was the domain of L, which is the range of L inverse. All right. Wowzers. So speed, we already said speed. That's the end of the example. Speed ds over Over dt, you could write it SDS over dt, which of course is the magnitude of the velocity. So that's your, it's the how the magnitude or length of your velocity vector. All right, unit tangent vector now. So you have some curve going along at any given point. Uh, let's say we're going to traverse this direction, and you got a start and some endpoint. But anywhere along the way, you can ask what is our tangent vector. It'll look something like that. Um, that relates back to usually we had a tangent line, so that was a line. But the tangent vector is a directed line segment, so it's obviously going to exist in the same uh, linear space as the tangent line but it's gonna have a direction on it. And not only that, it has a magnitude. <clears throat> and if we're watching a turtle go across this path, it's gonna go very slow, so this will be very short. If we're watching a uh, spaceship, you know, dodge asteroids or something cool like that, it probably has a very long tangent vector. And what we're gonna do is normalize it. So I want to get the unit tangent vector. So we got a tangent vector. What we need to do is either shrink it to magnitude one or uh, uh, grow it to uh, magnitude one. So either way, we're gonna do what we call normalizing. And that's exactly the process we saw before. We're gonna use T for this. So we have our velocity vector V, and all we're gonna do is divide by the magnitude of V. And you're allowed to do this exactly when you're not divided by zero. And the good news is, all the curves I'm gonna give you are gonna be smooth because you're gonna to need to take derivatives, so you better be able to take derivatives of these curves and they will not be allowed to stop because then you would not be able to talk about unit tangent vector or do a lot of the other cool stuff that we're doing. So we'll do one last example in this section. So we're gonna find the unit tangent vector and length traversed. So we we'll have a nice interval, zero to three. I'm probably gonna get lazy and just say curve instead of uh, smooth curve, but generally all of our curves are going to be smooth. Uh, I don't think I'll give you a curve that you cannot take derivative of. So they're all gonna be at least differentiable. There may be occasional where I give you a curve that uh, has a resting point or a stationary uh, point on it, but generally I won't. 
And I can see right here, just from any of the three parameters I'm looking at, but specifically just look at the last one, the easiest one, no matter what, the Z coordinate is gonna be increasing. So I can tell right now, this is never going to stop moving. This is always gonna go up, and granted it's gonna go in other two dimensions as well, but this curve's always gonna move. All right, when in doubt, take a derivative. Of course I need to here. So I want unit tangent vector. We'll just worry about length at the end. Uh, let's go with unit tangent vector first. So I need to get, first of all, velocity. So V of T is our prime of T. And I think we picked exceptionally easy one right here. There's R prime of T. Oh, this one's too easy, huh? I don't wanna make it that much tougher. Let's go with this. Um, we'll go with t squared, how about that? t squared, so that'll be 2t. All right, so there is v of t, 2t. All right, speed at time t is magnitude vt is, and I'm not sure I even have to compute this, So we got two plus four t squared. All right, so just looking at this, what t values make this zero? The answer is no real ones make it zero. I mean, if you wanna get super clever and throw imaginary ones in, but we're gonna keep it real in calculus class. So I can say without a doubt, uh, you can't even make it zero. Even uh, the smallest, the slowest this will ever go is time equals zero, but even then you're gonna travel at square root two speed. So speed's always positive, so thus our t is smooth. We obviously started out with differentiable functions. Uh, they were linear, linear, quadratic, so they're very smooth, very easy to take derivatives of, and we saw the speed's never zero, so it's smooth. Didn't really ask to show that, but we're just on a roll, so. Unit tangent vector. All right, so we got V. All I have to do is get magnitude of V, which we, oh, we did. All right, good, that was not a waste. We just made sure we wouldn't divide by zero. Fantastic. All right, T, and I can write of T. Oh, I should put a box around that. Unit tangent vector, pretty important. You probably don't need to write that condition down in your notes. Uh, at this point, you should be aware that anytime you divide by something, something that changes, uh, make sure it's never, not gonna be zero. All right, we got VT divided by magnitude VT. All right, V of T, one comma, negative one comma, two T divided by, that's four T squared. Now, if you're entering this in web work, some questions may take this as an answer, but you can always distribute. Remember, this is basically uh, alpha times, uh, let's go with x, y, z. So we're just using this rule. This is alpha x, comma, alpha y, alpha z. You're just distributing to all three pieces. So nothing special going on here. It's just gonna get a little bit more verbose. So how can we check if this actually, so we claim this was the unit tangent vector. We could test it by taking the magnitude of T, we better get one. And <clears throat> if we take the magnitude, it's better to take it in this form right here. because you can bring scalars 
the property I'm using alpha v magnitude is absolute value alpha times magnitude v. And same thing works v over alpha is magnitude v divided by absolute value alpha. So I'm going to test what this magnitude is. So the scalar is 2 plus 4t squared. Now, unless I screwed up this part earlier, somewhere over here, I got the magnitude of our original vector right here. And down below is the magnitude. We got 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2t squared is that exact square root right there. Which reduces to 1. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to test these things. I'm just showing you if you have extra time on your quiz or exam or uh, web work's not working out for you and you can't access anything else. This is a really quick way to test. Do you actually have a unit? So there we go. T's are, don't matter. It doesn't matter what T value you use. You're going to get one. Certainly all the T's between 0 and 3 will work out to be 1. Now I also asked for length traversed. And we used, I think, L of t for that. Uh, although we'll just go with regular arc length. We have n point 0 and 3. Magnitude uh, r prime t. We don't need to use taus because you can use taus if you want to, but you don't need to. 0 to 3. Somewhere we had the magnitude of r prime. Hopefully, here's r prime. Um, this is magnitude r prime t so 2 plus 4 t squared square root all right so i'm the one that changes problem from a really easy arc length problem to a way less easy arc length problem oh boy so how do we handle this somewhere in my brain i know tangent squared Theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. So let's rewrite this as square root 2 So I can see that square root 2 t equals tangent theta. And then take derivative of both sides, square root 2 dt equals your tangent is secant squared theta d theta. And oh, perfect. So we have a square root 2. DT. This is going to work out okay, except we're going to get secant cubed, which is one of my favorite. Oh, I better stay three. All right, square root one plus tan squared theta plus tangent squared theta secant squared theta d theta. Now I can turn the zero and the three into thetas, but instead I'm going to unsubstitute at the very end. Oh, I think I just dug a pretty deep hole for myself. So 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. Square root is secant. All right, so this is a secant cubed integral. Very fun one to do. This one shows up a lot more than uh, most of the other trig subs and it's worth reviewing integration by parts. So how do I know it's integration by parts? Because I'm really old and I've done a whole lot of these problems. But more specifically, I don't know the antiderivative secant cubed. You can try to turn secant squared. So let's try to avoid integration by parts. Uh, secant squared, we said, was tangent squared plus 1. So you can try your u subs here. Uh, the only one that makes sense is either secant or tangent. 
I don't think any other one works. If I go u equals secant, derivative of secant is secant tangent, which I don't see. And derivative, if u equals tangent, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, which I definitely don't see. Uh, it would be really nice if it was tan theta secant squared theta, but we're not gonna do that. That would be a very different problem. All right, so let's take out this whole wishful thinking attempt right here. We're gonna about to get an integration by parts. Secant theta secant squared d theta. All right, so I know, so let's write some stuff I know. D d t sec theta equals sec theta tan theta d d t tan theta secant squared theta. Wow, theta, theta, there we go, now I believe it. All right, so secant squared is perfect for an antiderivative. So we got integral u dv equals uv minus integral v du. So I'm gonna pick my derivative, what I want to integrate first. So that is dv. And then u is the leftovers, seek theta. Regular v is tan theta du. Drew secant is secant theta tan theta d theta. All right. So we got uv. uv secant theta tangent theta. Minus integral v du. So we got secant times tangent squared. All right, from here, what in the world do we do? So derivative of secant is secant tangent. Uh, derivative of tangent is secant squared, so those won't really help right here. So we'll turn tangent squared into, let's see, tangent squared is secant squared minus one. I'm going to split this into c cubed theta d theta plus integral c theta d theta. Oh, what is secant theta? I don't want to look it up. I think it's natural log of something. Come on, brain. Cheat sheets are for noobs. All right. <laughs> That's not how we do it. So hopefully this is will convince you you should always have a cheat sheet around. And if I had a cheat sheet, I would probably have the antiderivative secant theta on it. I also don't have my book and I'm not gonna run upstairs. That's way too much effort. I'd rather do an extra 10 minutes of calculus. Oh yeah, yeah.
True secant is secant theta tan theta. True of tangent is sec squared theta d theta. All right, obviously that was the right thing to do. So the entire numerator is du over u, ln u, which is ln c theta plus tan theta. All right. So we are almost done. We started out with integral secant cubed theta. Was all this madness. So we get two, I'm adding like terms together. And divide by two. No problem, no problem. So I could go back to T's. Do I want to? Let's turn T's into thetas. Somewhere was my T sub, all right. So I'm looking right here. So regular t is one over square root two, tan theta. Oh, I actually want to leave it as square root two t, tan theta. All right, t equals zero is easy. T equals zero, we got uh, square root two times zero, so we get zero equals tan theta, so theta equals zero. The other one, three, why in the heck did I choose three? I don't know. equals three, we got square root two times three equals tan theta. And whereas three square root two over one equals tan theta. And from here we can make our triangle theta opposite three square root two adjacent one a square root three square root two squared is 18 plus one 19 secant theta one over comes theta so that's square root 19 over something else cosine adjacent one square root 19 all right, wow. So I'm gonna do something weird here. So we're starting at uh, 
theta equals zero. I don't want to say what we're ending at uh, in terms of thetas, but I will write uh, seek theta. I guess it was square root 19. Tan theta two. Oh, is it three square root two? Somewhere, yeah, three square root two. No way I'm even going to estimate what this natural log is. All right, so secant theta is square root 19 uh, plus 3 square root 2. Minus, now I'm going to plug in theta 0. So tangent 0 is 0. Uh, secant 0 is 1. That seems right. Yeah, secant zero, 0 is 1. 1 times 0, 1 times 0, plus ln 1 plus 0, which actually is 0. Right, ln of 1 is 0. Yep. All right. Yeah, 1 half. Okay, and that number is pretty much useless. And if you plug into a calculator, you can get some value out of it. Hopefully there's no mistakes. It's not like I really did that much work to find that out. Kidding. All right, this is a really good place to end. My brain hurts, and that's the end of the section.